Shalom. My name is Avraham Ben Shalom. And I want to talk to you a moment here about some very important information that I want to share with you about trying to help you understand the subject of is the earth indeed flat? There are many people out there that have been trying to use scriptures and passages in order to try to prove their arguments. And the best thing I want to do here is actually show you how Hebrew functions before you even dare to even think about how these people are going about using the passages and using the words that they found from these very passages. Because it's, it's important if, if you want to understand what on earth the Bible is really saying, you have to understand that the Bible was written in Hebrew. And for those people who don't know Hebrew, well, you need to understand how Hebrew functions. And this is why I want to take the time and share these things with you so that you can understand. How is it to be understood based upon what scriptures actually teach? Well, one of the things I want to share with you is one of the most difficult parts with the fact with, with people who are going out there trying to prove that the earth is indeed flat. And they're trying to use scriptures. One of them is Rob Skiba, for example. And I want to show you, you know, the fact of when we're looking at Hebrew, which you know, Hebrew is not a very simple language. And for a lot of people who don't know anything about Hebrew, well, it's very important to understand the dynamics of how Hebrew functions. And before I go into showing you dictionaries and showing you definitions and showing you the broad ranges of things, I want to share with you the dynamics of Hebrew functions, how Hebrew works with roots. Hebrew is a language that's based upon a root structure, which means that there are letters that incorporate the meaning of a word. And the way Hebrew functions is Hebrew functions on an action-based language. So that means that all of my nouns and all the words that I, I have in the Hebrew language, um, whether it's... Um, nouns, adjectives, and things, these first all come from a root, which is an action-based root. And the action-based root incorporates what is considered the idea that is being described with regard to the function, the characteristics, and the quality of what a thing is doing. Let's take, for example, the root Kof Vav Mem. Kof Vav Mem means to rise or to stand up. And when we look at the, the nouns that are coming from Kof Vav Mem, we have a, a slew of them which all carry the conceptual understanding of something that goes upward or is in an upright position. For example, the top word, kuma, kuma, which is the word for height, in which height is in regard to something that is upward. Okay. Um, the next word you have, which is kumamiot, is to act in a way that is correct or right, which means the concept we see here is someone who's standing up in a in a state in the stance of living by which he is doing what is needed what is correct in other words uh, the, the the understanding of this noun we find here is is someone who is walking in a upright manner he's walking in a, a manner that is considered acceptable and good behavior then you have the other noun kim one who rises up against his fellow for evil and so keem is you can see is when you find it's the conceptualization of the people who stand up against others in order to try to cause harm and the next down we can look at here is comma stocks of grain because the grains of stock grow upward and they they stand erect 
So you could you, you could see just by looking at these words, you know, yakum, that which is made to rise up. Here the Kant is related to the idea of things brought into existence and given life to move. So you you you, you by looking at this root kum, you find that it is directly related to the nouns that are presented here. Let's give you a, another one. Omed, which is uh, come from the Ayn Memdalet, the Hebrew root to stand or remain in position. Here, Omed means a fixed position or place. So you can see clearly the uh, the root's connection to how this place is functioning. What would you? How is this place defined? Or Ma'amda, or Ma'amad. Ma'amad is an area taken under control. So this is, you know, be a fortified place that's been brought under siege to control uh, it from from other enemies that would try to come against it. Um, and the second word that you see, Ma'amad, which is the vowel is a little different, but it's the same meaning here. Ramud is an upright support beam. So Amud is here is to remain a position this holds the the building the structure of the building so you know when they were when when hebrew jews are looking at this this thing back in the days when these nouns were being brought forth you know they they, they identified the objects and the things based upon its function and characteristics and it always is entailed with the connection to the root that's why you, you look at the next word, amda, an area position one holds in control of. So this would be a fortified area that uh, you know an army post would be holding in order to um, to keep the enemies from having the ability to attack and to overcome. And uh, we just look at a, another route here, the third, nun um, bet which is to stand or take one stand or to stand in opposition to where you get the word nitzav, the handle of a sword and here the handle of a sword the concept was is you would hold the sword in your hand when you were going to fight in opposition to your enemy and so they called this part of the sword the nitzav and then you have a matseva which is an upright immovable object um, which of course that's to you find that it's connected to the issue of to be in a, a fixed position or stance. Mitzava, uh, one who stands in a fixed position in order to withstand external opposition. So this would be considered um, a, a fixed post of an army that's gone out in order to um, control an area um, continually in order to withstand an opposition there and then you see mitzvah uh, mutzav a fixed area which went which dug in order to withstand external opposition so here you have this is you know kind of like a fox arrow area with um uh fortified posts and stuff to withstand um external opposition matzav is a fixed area which is used to withstand external opposition and the last word, Nitziv, which is an upright beam or temporal area, which is used to withstand external opposition. Now you find all of these words are directly connected to the root. There is nothing that they mean that's outside of the root connection. This is why it's so vitally important to understand how Hebrew functions. If you're going to think about it in Hebrew, the best thing to understand is, is Shurashim are basically actions, if you want to think about it, okay? And the actions express an idea, and from it we create different uh, multiple nouns based upon this idea. And the way Hebrew functions is, is Hebrew likes to take, and this is how we have to think, we have to begin to think in Hebrew. Hebrew likes to take a action and identify the thing by that action. So we don't call something, for example, a gift because we label it that. It's not like English. English likes to label stuffing, you know. English likes to call, for example, a thing you put babies in a stroller, okay, or a 
a things that you put uh, food in in a grocery store, a shopping cart. And you kind of have this idea that's completely separate from each other. And we create different nouns based upon the different identifications, what we want to call it. But the problem is it doesn't really tell me much about the thing. I have to basically learn new words in order to understand what this new object is. In Hebrew, these things that we do is we, we, we have to understand the idea. And the idea is this verbal action. What is it doing? How does it, how does it function? And how does it to be identified based upon this function? And that's how we create nouns. Everything in Hebrew is based upon function. The function of the thing is where we get the meaning, okay? So based upon the function, we get the meaning, okay? And when we think of Hebrew, we have to think very conceptually. And that's not so hard because if you think about in English, we have a lot of words that are very conceptual. We just don't think about them as that because we just use them every single day when we, when we speak in English. Think of the word law, for example. If somebody said he went to the law, you could know that uh, from a contextual standpoint that the word law means like a police officer. Or if he said to a person, that's against the law, you would know that that, that law is being used in the concept of he's violating some kind of um, legal uh, edict, something that was uh, dictated as to what you're not permitted to do. Um, if the person said, for example, um, he, uh, he went over and, 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 and went to uh, the, the, the givers of the law, uh, or he, he went to the law and sat down and stood before the judge, um, you, you, the law could be in a generic sense of this idea of, of the court and the court systems. And so you kind of get the idea of what I'm saying here. It may not be all perfect and stuff, but you, you kind of get the idea of what I'm saying. Well, this is what we're doing here. You're taking this concept and you have to understand this concept. And from this concept, we're creating different words. So when we look at this word here, for example, Niset. What is Niset? Niset, we say, is a gift. But that doesn't really help me understand unless I start putting it into an actual Shorish mentality. They're going back to the conceptualization. What is a gift? A gift is something we lift and carry. It's something that we bring when we're going to people's houses or we bring and we care when we're going to somebody in order to uh, give them something that's a very special, a very... Uh, you know, loving and, 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 and showing honor or respect or to, uh, to celebrate. And so in Hebrew, we're talking about something that's lifted up in our hands that we bring. And so that's why we call it a niset. In English, we call it a gift. But in Hebrew, it's something that you're lifting up and bringing. Um, another thing is, look at this now, is nesua. Nesua is a carried object. So here you have this lifting up being incorporated into this thing called a carried object. Some people call it a, a burden, which is kind of very ha horrible in English because um, many people, when they think burden, they first mind they think of something bad. And they don't understand that burden just means something that's carried. And um, it's kind of a very old way of speaking. Um, and a lot of people don't even really utilize the concept of thinking of that way anymore. And that's where you get this false understanding when you read in Jeremiah or Isaiah where it says you should not lift a burden uh, on the Sabbath. And they think, well, that's something that's difficult and hard. This is obviously carrying my keys isn't hard or carrying a marker is not hard. But that's not actually what the Hebrew is saying. The Hebrew is saying something that's lifted up, something that's been picked up and carried. Uh, another word is the word see. What does see mean? It means something lifted up characteristically. It's, it's an attitude that we have when we lift up uh, an, a person or we lift up and uh, a, a concept of how somebody is, you know, like when people look at movie stars and they lift them up in their eyes as big, important and stuff. That's what this word is referring to, see. Then we have the word mas, which means a lifted up attitude placed upon a person. All right. That's like an attitude of respect or honor. It's, it's this mas that you have when, you, when you're looking at a person like a grandfather or, or maybe a father figure. Or maybe it's a, a, your teacher. You know, it's an attitude of mas that you have. We have here this next word, which is maset. What is maset? It's an ascending movement. Um, this is like used for, for example, when it talks about smoke that's moving up in an ascending movement. And so this is referring to an ascending movement 
and of course we would have a noun attached to it at the end which would identify what type of ascending we're referring to what is it um, the next word here is called se'et 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 has a few different conceptual meanings uh, one of them has to do with swelling so it's the lifting up of the skin so that's uh, what a set is, the lifting of a skin. So like, you know, when you get like a, like a really nasty burn and your skin begins to lift up, that's what a set is. It's called a lifting up of the skin. Um, another thing is the lifting up of facial expression. So like, you know, when this person's sad and, and hey, they, they start to smile and stuff, that's also called a set. It's the lifting up of the skin, as you can see, but it's in a different manner. Um, another, another definition for set is a positive sentence. What's a positive sentence? You know, it's something that lifts the person up, uh, and, and, and he realizes instead of being convicted, he's been actually found to be innocent. All right. Um, this next word we're going to look at is set. Set means a rising up or a lifting. So once again, you see this the concept of to lift up, a rising up or lifting up of something. Okay. Uh, next word. This is similar to this word here, masa. Masa is something that's carried or lifted. So, uh, to translate this burden, as you can see in stuff, which many people have a very messed up idea, that we see the fact of the importance of, in Hebrew, um, Hebrew wants us to understand uh, the, the, the first, the shorish, before we get to the actual word meaning. So we can understand, what's he really saying? Um, and to understand how to translate this in the, in the correct way, in our own head, so we can know uh, what this is referring to. So if we looked at the word masa, we're talking about something that's, that can be carried or lifted up. So that, that could be any object. It can be a book, it could be a chair, it could be a table. That's any kind of object whatsoever. And lastly, uh, we have is masa'a. Masa'a is a rising flame. So we see how the word is always connected to the shorish. There's always this connection always this connection that you find that talks about something being lifted up. This is why we learn Shorashim. Because when we learn the Shorashim, we can understand the real essence and meaning of the word, and now we can go back and we can learn Hebrew correctly, and we can translate these things in our head properly. And that's how Hebrew thinks. That's how we are to think when we're thinking in Hebrew, is we have to think about the quality, the function, the attributes, and the actions of how a thing works. And from that, we create nouns. So when we're looking at, for example, somebody who points out the word hug, and they immediately want to point to what they would consider a blat blatant in-your-face definition. They, they Google it, they throw something out there, and they throw it. This is the worst way to ever believe in anything when it comes to Hebrew, because I want you to understand how very complex uh, Hebrew is. And you can see the differentiations of how different time periods in different people when they were striving to describe the root of Hug and going through and trying to pinpoint um, the understanding of how this root is functioning, what's the attributes, what's the descriptions, um, you will see that there's variances within dictionaries. Uh, one of the first dictionaries I'm going to show you on the screen here is a actual German Hebrew dictionary. Uh, which means it's a Hebrew dictionary that was made in Germany. You can read on, on the top, it's very worn down in the picture here. And when you look up the word hug in this dictionary, it will say to describe a circle or to enclose. And the other second hug, which is used, means a circle or horizon or the vault of heaven. And so, for a person who would read this, they're thinking that they're basically taking a word and just literally translating it for what it is because they see these words. However, that's only because that person who's never learned Hebrew, who's never known how Hebrew works and how Hebrew functions, they have not been taught how to first learn and understand Hebrew. And this is why... Any real Hebrew student out there who knows how Hebrew functions will agree and say, 
you have to learn the roots first and you have to understand how roots work and that's why I'm actually going into this detail of actually helping you understand the issue of roots and how roots work because it's from the root that we get the word and it's the description and the function of the word and so this very dictionary might in fact make people think that it means circle or um, as they would see the vault of heaven but here's some problems that I'm going to pinpoint here is if we look at for example the word horizon okay and if I was to for example go on my dictionary because I want to find a, a literal definition of horizon and I wanted to say you know what what does horizon literally mean you know besides just the the way I use it on a common every day-to-day -day basis this is the part where you would find that you know when going through a dictionary and seeking to define the words and to understand the words meaning that all of a sudden when we're looking at the English definition of the word horizon and we're seeking to understand what a person's point was the word horizon means a line at which the earth's surface and the sky appear to meet okay or the limit of a per of a person's mental perception experience or interest so obviously it's the first definition of what the person's giving here now the problem with the word horizon is if I look at the word hug and I think of it as a line by which the earth's surface and the sky appear to meet well there is an issue here and the reason that is is my mind doesn't really understand hug because I'm thinking of a point by which two parts meet and come together the other thing is when we see hug as the vault of heaven when we look at the word vault for example and we go to define to get a literal standpoint of what is a vault we're, we're following the form of thinking of this a roof in the form of an arc or a series of arcs so now I'm thinking in this mentality of a half circle when I think of the vault a hug as being the vault of heaven however this completely contradicts both horizon and the first definition which it says circle and this is where you have major major problems because now what you're doing is you're trying to create a theology based upon your different point of views of using these words vault and using the word horizon and then you're not knowing that the first definition is circle and of course you don't even realize what even the root really means and yet the first description that's given here in this definition hug means to describe a circle or enclosure okay or to enclose right this is what this definition gives right now I'm going to show you as we go forward um, there are more dictionaries which I'm going to be trying to do. I'm going to show you six in total and to give you an understanding of how difficult when you go to take uh, a Hebrew word and you try to use a dictionary's definition and you're going to see the variances between the one and another the next dictionary I'm going to show you here um, this is the Analytical Hebrew and Chaldean Lexicon by uh, Benjamin Davidson, written in the 1800s. And here he describes Hug as the root to draw a circle or to circumscribe. And then he gives the noun uh, connection of Hug to be a circle or sphere. Now, notice this he, uh, this is a group of people obviously that did this. Um, the, the, the dictionary that we see here and stuff um, but here we find the word hug is described as a circle slash and it says sphere and then we have another noun which comes from the same root hug which is mehuga which is the word for compass or compasses okay so 
here, if you were to read this dictionary, you would see to draw a circle, uh, chug literally would mean to go in a round motion. Okay, so you would understand, okay, to go in a round motion, and chug is something that is round. And so you have two different possibilities of understanding the word chug, one being sphere and the other one being a circle. So in this one, you would say, well, this obviously contradicts the other one because the other one said a chug was a fault, a chug was a horizon, where here, this one says a chug is a circle and a sphere, and this one says that the meaning of Chug and the root meant to draw a circle or circumscribe, where the other one uh, meant to describe a circle or to enclose. So now you, you can kind of start seeing that you might find yourself being kind of confused. What 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 is chug? All right, well, it gets better. I'm going to show you on. So now um, I'm going to take you to another dictionary. This is Collier Bumgarter, very popular, very it's expensive dictionary. Um, and we're going to look at how Collier Baumgartner's dictionary describes this very thing. And see here in, in Collier Baumgartner's dictionary, um, Hug, he brings up um, the Syriac, he brings up the uh, Mishnaic Hebrew, and he brings up the fact that he says that Hug, um, in, in Hug, to describe a circle. So now we find this one's describing a circle. Okay, so he gives you the meaning of chug as to describe a circle. Now, if you take that with the first definition to describe a circle, you're saying, okay, well, they, the, 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 obviously the uh, German one is more closer in connection to this one because it holds on to the same definition. And um, the one with uh, Davidson is to draw the circle okay which means to obviously to go in a circle is a little different so it does it mean describe a circle does it mean to draw a circle okay but then when we get to the other point where hug okay um here uh we find in this thing is this circle the earth described as a disc and so here their version is they 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 look at the earth as being described as a disc and they see that chug al tahum, that the chug is used as the term for horizon, um, which he describes it with regard to Isaiah 44:20, and then chug shemaim, um, chug shemaim is the vault of heaven. Now, once again, first off, you see that these were all a part of the first definition that you found in the German dictionary. However, when you look at the root. It describes a circle. So now you have to understand this because of learning Hebrew, the way Hebrew functions, nouns come from verbs. Nouns come from the description. So the description of to describe a circle would mean that the understanding and the concept of a circular thing will be connected to the noun, chug ha'aretz, the circle of the earth, or chug al tohum, which would be the circle that's on the face of the deep, okay? Or chug shemaim, the circle of heaven. So, yes, they're defining it in different terminologies, horizon and vault, but the problem is you have to take it and put it back into the root in order to really understand the mentality of Hebrew. And you're going to see the fact that to describe a circle, that the circular aspects um, always stay intact because that's how roots are created. Uh, that's how nouns are created from roots. They're, they're coming from that root, which is telling you how it's described. Now, here's a problem here. If we look at the issue that's being presented which we have to face and focus on, you can't have a circle which is being described in a completely diatomically opposed area. A horizon cannot be, as you think in the English, as a circle if you're thinking a flat earth, because a flat earther wants to think 
a straight line. And the word hug does not mean straight. It means circular. And you also cannot have a vault when you're thinking as a flat earther as something that's a half dome because the word means a circle. The, the Torah is telling us that heaven is a circular object and it surrounds the earth which is also a circular object and of course you know this is the problem you're, you're taking this noun and they're applying some of these definitions which even the definitions this dictionary is saying here is completely opposed to the root you don't have a horizon and a vault and a disk and they're all the same. A vault is not the same. A vault is a half circle. It is not a full circle. It may be circular in its kind of shape, but it's not a circle, okay, when we're looking at the issue of this object here. And obviously nobody would even logically even dare to say that heaven is flat. This is the thing that uh, you know, any person out there who even wants to try to argue the flat earth thing, they would never dare to try to argue a flat heaven because then you'd have to completely reject the issue of the sun and the moon and all the other luminaries in the sky. So obviously the issue that this, the, the Torah is saying to us here and the, and the Hebrew is showing to us is that the earth is a sphere. It is a round circular sphere. And with relation to the issue of the horizon, well, the horizon also is a circle because when you have a spherical Earth, you have a spherical horizon. You see, I, I, I'm not making this stuff up. This goes to show the word hug is absolutely connected to the root. Now, when you're looking at the way they translated it here in this dictionary, uh, you're going to get confused. But then, if you look at the X, the dictionary I gave you before, and if you look at the other dictionary, now you can start making sense out of the fact of, ah, now I can understand why they translated the word horizon, because they knew Hug was talking about a spherical earth with a spherical horizon. Now I can understand about, they call it the vault, because Hug was referring to a spherical vault that surrounds the spherical earth. And this is important to understand as I, before I get to the next dictionary because y you have to look at these things and logically start going through this in order to really make sense out of what you're looking at. If you're not going to want to use sense and reason, well then you know, I might as well stop the video now because I want to sensibly talk to you and show you through Hebrew what it literally is showing you and what it literally is expressing as opposed to what people want others to believe because of just reading some English version. So, now let's go into a, another dictionary. This one is going to be the Comprehensive Etymological Dictionary of the Hebrew Language, uh, written by Ernest Klein in the uh, early, I think it was like 1900s or so. And you'll see with his definition of Hug. Okay, so Hug, he says Hug is to make a circle or move in a circle. So now you have he holds to the 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 first definition um to uh or the second definition excuse me which was not the the germans one it was the one that was done by davidson when davidson created his to draw the circle so you can see that here to make a circle to draw the circle it's uh, very similar to move in a circle now now we have something that's a little different because the other ones was to describe a circle and here he's talking about it's the movements the physical movement of a circle and now he gives you uh the different uh points he made a circle moved in a circle he says in here the apex legume of the bible occurs in job 26 10. so here you can literally go to job 26 10 and you can actually find the point what he says here so i'll just go to job 26 10 real quick and i'll even throw the verse up on here so in job 
uh, 26.10, all right, he says, He compasses the water with bounds until the day and night come to an end. Okay? So he says that moves in a circle is what he's talking about referring to this passage here. Okay? So you have to now understand that um, the Hebrew words as he's going through here uh, which is, and I'll actually uh, read to you the, the Hebrew in this, um, because this is the differentiation, because see, this is a translation, this is a simple KJV translation that I'm reading to you, where it says, he has compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. Whereas when we read it in the Hebrew, we, we find that the Hebrew is giving us a picture of something that's a, a, a bit different, which correlates with what we see that Ernest Klein talks about here. So here we, the passage says, "Huk chag al penemain ad techelit or im choshech." So huk is a described limit of chag, and see this is where he says here is that chag he's describing is is referred to a a circle okay so he's saying the described limit of a circle is upon the face of the water so the water is referred to as being round okay this is so you can see the global picture that's being presented here ad tikhlit until the completion of or im choshek with light with darkness and this is the, the 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 idealism that you find in this passage which you know this is pointing to the fact we live on a globe earth and this is um ernest klein who's talking to us and telling us that it that the word hug means to move in a circle and then he gives the noun of hug is circle circuit horizon and when we understand the concept of of horizon Remember, the chug is the root, and so it's not talking about a flat horizon. It's talking about a circular horizon, which encompasses the world. It's very different than the fact of the way you're looking at English or when you're looking at a word, because um, in Hebrew we use roots that describe what it is that we're speaking about and what we're speaking in regard to. So when we go to look at, for example, like Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, when he says, Hayushev al Hug Haaretz, who dwells upon the Hug, the Hug here is the noun. This is now telling me that I'm talking about a circular object. And what is the circular object? Haaretz, the earth. The Yosheva and its inhabitants gavim are like grasshoppers. Okay, so the Torah is telling me here that the or the Isaiah scroll I should say is telling me here that the the the, the earth is a circular object. Now a lot of people they say, okay, you know, they believe that because they want to believe in flat earth, they just want to hold on to that belief and have a have a, a strong biased standpoint of thinking. They're not listening very carefully to the scriptures and I, we're going to point I'm going to point out here um, the next passage which is very important to understand and this is Job 22:14 okay Job 22:14 and I'm going to be turning to this but I'm going to read to you uh, this I'm going to I'm going to put basically the the Hebrew and English on here it says in Job 22:14 thick clouds are covering to him that he seeth not. He walketh in the circuit of heaven. Now, now here, this was how they translated the word chug. They call it now the circuit of heaven. Well, here, remember the word chug was used to meaning the circle of the earth. So if we were to actually go to Job and to look at 22.14, so in Job 22.14 in the Hebrew, it's the same Hebrew root. It's the same Hebrew word in 22.14, where he says, Avdei seter lo, velo yirei. He says, um, 
thick clouds are hidden to him that he will not see. V'chug shemaim yithalech. In the circle of heaven, he will walk all about. Okay, so here it makes the heaven also a circle. So here you have Isaiah 40.22, which says the earth is a circle. You have Job 22.14, which says the heaven is a circle. And people want to say, well, yes, this makes sense. It's the flat earth, the, you know, the, the earth is round. But they're not thinking through this thing like they need to. Because when we go to read the book of Genesis, which is the beginning of what the Torah tells us a bit about the creation of, of earth, the Torah says in Genesis, when it talks about um, the creation of earth, it says that, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 6, it says, And God said, Let there be a rakia in the midst of the water. So the water is what is defined as this body by which um, heaven is now being formed in. And the Bible says, Batuch. Batuch literally means inside of. So inside of the water is where this rakia is. Vihi mafdil, and it will separate between the maim, uh, the maim, the maim, from the maim and the water, from the water and water. So now there's going to be two forms of water, one by which the Torah says here that God was going to make go upward, and one which the Bible says that God would make go downward. And this is where we find, when God says in this passage here, he says that it would separate between the mind which is above and the mind which is below. And then he says here, and he called the Rakia Shemaim. So here in this description that's given in the scriptures of the first passage of Genesis, it tells us that literally Shemaim is the Rakia. And that the Rakia is the actual body that is brought inside of the water. And inside of the water is the separation created. And the separation separates the upper water from the lower water. So the lower water is considered where earth is now formed. And the middle part is considered literally... Shemaim, the heaven. And then the upper water is considered Hashemaim, the heaven. And so we find that we literally have a circle that's within another circle because as we see, the book of Isaiah says the earth is a circle. And that is the center of the the center of the universe and then the bible says in i job 22 14 thick clouds cover him and seeth not and he walketh in the circle of heaven this now tells us that heaven is a circle as well and that this heaven is referring to as the space this rakia so this rakia encompasses all of the surrounding areas of the earth so you have a circle, which is the earth, and you have an outer circle, which goes outside of the earth, and that's heaven, and they have an outside that, which is the heaven, and that's where the mime is. And you can't have a flat earth theology based upon the very thing of what scripture is teaching here, showing the fact that here the earth actually is a circle that is inside of another circle and that other circle is that space and that outside of that space the bible says is heaven so the torah is telling us and the torah is teaching us that the mime and everything inside of the mime and everything inside of that part you have the mime is pushed into the center you have the rakia, which surrounds the mime that's in the center. And then you have the mime that surrounds the outside of the space. And therefore, you have the lower mime, which is the earth. The shemaim, which is the space that surrounds the earth. 
And then you have mind, which is heaven, which surrounds the space. And this is what the scripture gives. So there's no way of, by the scripture's description that we see, that there is any such thing as a flat earth. And you can't put flat earth in the category of what the scripture says here. So now I'm going to continue on just, just going through the fact of uh, other dictionaries. So if you go to the Brown, Driver, and Briggs, the Brown, Driver, and Briggs uh, goes and tells you that hug means to draw round or make a circle. And the hug as a noun, it makes the word vault. And so you have, a, you know, a person when he's reading this dictionary, the noun, He's thinking in English. He's not thinking in Hebrew. And see, you can't think in English when trying to learn Hebrew. You have to think in Hebrew by giving, by being given a really good Hebrew definition, which this is obviously not even giving. It's a very simple definition that makes sense to a person who understands the Hebrew real well. But for a person who doesn't understand the Hebrew well, it, it doesn't make any sense. He's just going to think of a vault as being some kind of, like, you know, covering overlaid area. And that's going to come from the fact that the person's mistaken understanding is coming from his literally taking exactly what the dictionary is saying and just applying it to what he's reading. And this, this is why this is a major problem. And last but not least, we finally we have the Etymological Dictionary of Biblical Hebrew, uh, written by um, um, Shepson Raphael Hirsch, but was put together by Mitiawa Clark. And here in his dictionary, um, he describes that hug means encircle. And he used the word hug is encircle. Um, he gives you. Um, Two other different, three other definitions: encircling, observing a secular holiday, or a compass. And so, here, in his uh, root uh, dictionary, he he describes the issue of hug as to is encircling, going around and around. And so, this is where you find that you know when you when you actually go to go through all these different Hebrew dictionaries and all these different Hebrew definitions you start finding that you know the concept that there was trying to be grasped at was the fact that it has to do with a circular rounded movement and it's the description of the root and then when describing it into the noun it had to do with something that was round in shape and that it's not necessarily speaking of a physical circle that's flat, like people want to sit there and think, you know, so it's like, you know, you're, you're taking these dictionaries a lot more greater in your trusting of everything that's being said, rather than understanding um, the essence of what they're trying to convey. And I do understand the dictionaries are definitely difficult and they don't really help give the full picture like you would wish and that they would not be so difficult with the things that they did and I really think they should have made you know a more conceptualized dictionary when coming up with the Hebrew dictionary rather than the ones that they created but I hope this uh, will continually help um, the different problems that exist within this whole flat earth belief and that you can dispel these notions based upon um, the realisms of what Hebrew really is implying and showing and also what these scriptures also convey and prove and disprove also with regard to the belief for the flat earth. I'll see you next time.